Chapter 5 Account Overdrawn It was the first failure in the history of Reardon Steel. For the first time an order was not delivered as promised. But by February 15th, when the Taggart Rail was due, it made no difference to anyone any longer. Winter had come early, in the last days of November. People said that it was the hardest winter on record and that no one could be blamed for the unusual severity of the snowstorms. They did not care to remember that there had been a time when snowstorms did not sweep unresisted down unlighted roads and upon the roofs of unheated houses, did not stop the movement of trains, did not leave a wake of corpses counted by the hundreds. The first time that Daniger Cole was late in delivering fuel to Taggart Transcontinental, in the last week of December, Daniger's cousin explained that he could not help it. He had had to cut the workday down to six hours, he said, in order to raise the morale of the men who did not seem to function as they had in the days of his cousin Kenneth. The men had become listless and sloppy, he said, because they were exhausted by the harsh discipline of the former management. He could not help it if some of the superintendents and foremen had quit him without reason men who had been with the company for ten to twenty years. He could not help it if there seemed to be some friction between his workers and his new supervisory staff, even though the new men were much more liberal than the old slave drivers. It was only a matter of readjustment, he said. He could not help it, he said, if the tonnage intended for Taggart Transcontinental had been turned over on the eve of its scheduled delivery to the Bureau of Global Relief for shipment to the people's state of England. It was an emergency. The people of England were starving with all of their state factories closing down. And Miss Taggart was being unreasonable, since it was only a matter of one day's delay. It was only one day's delay. It caused a three days delay in the run of freight train number 386, bound from California to New York with 59 carloads of lettuce and oranges. Freight train number 386 waited on sidings, at coaling stations, for the fuel that had not arrived. When the train reached New York, the lettuce and oranges had to be dumped into the East River. They had waited their turn too long in the freight houses of California, with the train schedules cut and the engines forbidden by directive to pull a train of more than sixty cars. Nobody but their friends and trade associates noticed that three orange growers in California went out of business, as well as two lettuce farmers in Imperial Valley. Nobody noticed the closing of a commission house in New York, of a plumbing company to which the commission house owed money, of a lead pipe wholesaler who had supplied the plumbing company. When people were starving, said the newspapers, one did not have to feel concern over the failures of business enterprises, which were only private ventures for private profit. The coal shipped across the Atlantic by the Bureau of Global Relief did not reach the people's state of England. It was seized by Ranyar Danischold. The second time that Daniger Coal was late in delivering fuel to Taggart Transcontinental in mid-January, Daniger's cousin snarled over the telephone that he could not help it. His mines had been shut down for three days due to a shortage of lubricating oil for the machinery. The supply of coal to Taggart Transcontinental was four days late. Mr. Quinn of the Quinn Ball Bearing Company, which had once moved from Connecticut to Colorado, waited a week for the freight train that carried his order of Reardon steel. When the train arrived, the doors of the Quinn Ball Bearing Company's plant were closed. Nobody traced the closing of a motor company in Michigan that had waited for a shipment of ball bearings, its machinery idle, its workers on full pay, or the closing of a sawmill in Oregon that had waited for a new motor, or the closing of a lumber yard in Iowa left without supply, or the bankruptcy of a building contractor in Illinois, who, failing to get his lumber on time, found his contracts cancelled, and the purchasers of his homes sent wandering off down snow-swept roads in search of that which did not exist anywhere any longer. The snowstorm that came at the end of January blocked the passes through the Rocky Mountains, raising white walls thirty feet high across the mainline track of Taggart Transcontinental. The men who attempted to clear the track gave up within the first few hours. The rotary plows broke down one after another. The plows had been kept in precarious repair for two years past the span of their usefulness. The new plows had not been delivered. The manufacturer had quit, unable to obtain the steel he needed from Oren Boyle. Three westbound trains were trapped on the sidings of Winston Station, high in the Rockies, where the main line of Taggart Transcontinental cut across the northwest corner of Colorado. For five days they remained beyond the reach of help. Trains could not approach them through the storm. The last of the trucks, made by Lawrence Hammond, 
broke down on the frozen grades of the mountain highways. The best of the airplanes, once made by Dwight Sanders, were sent out, but never reached Winston Station. They were worn past the stage of fighting a storm. Through the driving mesh of snow, the passengers trapped aboard the trains looked out at the lights of Winston's shanties. The lights died in the night of the second day. By the evening of the third, the lights, the heat, and the food had given out aboard the trains. In the brief lulls of the storm, when the white mesh vanished and left behind it the stillness of a black void, merging a lightless earth with a starless sky, the passengers could see, many miles away to the south, a small tongue of flame twisting in the wind. It was Wyatt's torch. By the morning of the sixth day, when the trains were able to move and proceed down the slopes of Utah, of Nevada, of California, the trainmen observed the smokeless stacks and the closed doors of small trackside factories, which had not been closed on their last run. Storms are an act of God, wrote Bertram Scudder and nobody can be held socially responsible for the weather. The rations of coal established by Wesley Mooch permitted the heating of homes for three hours a day. There was no wood to burn, no metal to make new stoves, no tools to pierce the walls of the houses for new installations. In makeshift contraptions of bricks and oil cans, professors were burning the books of their libraries, and fruit growers were burning the trees of their orchards. Privation strengthened a people's spirit, wrote Bertram Scudder, and forged the fine steel of social discipline. Sacrifice is the cement which unites human bricks into the great edifice of society. The nation which had once held the creed that greatness is achieved by production is now told that it is achieved by squalor, said Francisco d'Anconia in a press interview. But this was not printed. The only business boom that winter came to the amusement industry. People wrenched their pennies out of the quicksands of their food and heat budgets and went without meals in order to crowd into movie theaters, in order to escape for a few hours the state of animals reduced to the single concern of terror over their crudest needs. In January, all movie theaters, nightclubs, and bowling alleys were closed by order of Wesley Mooch for the purpose of conserving fuel. Pleasure is not an essential of existence, wrote Bertram Scudder. You must learn to take a philosophical attitude, said Dr. Simon Pritchett to a young girl student who broke down into sudden hysterical sobs in the middle of a lecture. She had just returned from a volunteer relief expedition to a settlement on Lake Superior. She had seen a mother holding the body of a grown son who had died of hunger. There are no absolutes, said Dr. Pritchett. Reality is only an illusion. How does that woman know that her son is dead? How does she know that he ever existed? People with pleading eyes and desperate faces crowded into tents where evangelists cried in triumphant gloating that man was unable to cope with nature, that his science was a fraud, that his mind was a failure, that he was reaping punishment for the sin of pride, for his confidence in his own intellect, and that only faith in the power of mystic secrets could protect him from the fissure of a rail or from the blowout of the last tire on his last truck. Love was the key to the mystic secrets, they cried. Love! and selfless sacrifice to the needs of others. Orrin Boyle made a selfless sacrifice to the needs of others. He sold to the Bureau of Global Relief for shipment to the people state of Germany 10,000 tons of structural steel shapes that had been intended for the Atlantic Southern Railroad. It was a difficult decision to make, he said with a moist, unfocused look of righteousness to the panic-stricken president of the Atlantic Southern. But I weighed the fact that you are a rich corporation while the people of Germany are in a state of unspeakable misery. So I acted on the principle that need comes first, when in doubt it's the weak that must be considered, not the strong. The president of the Atlantic Southern had heard that Orrin Boyle's most valuable friend in Washington had a friend in the Ministry of Supply of the People's State of Germany. But whether this had been Boyle's motive, or whether it had been the principle of sacrifice, no one could tell. And it made no difference. If Boyle had been a saint of the creed of selflessness, he would have had to do precisely what he had done. This silenced the president of the Atlantic Southern. He dared not admit that he cared for his railroad more than for the people of Germany. He dared not argue against the principle of sacrifice. 